Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another episode in the Toxic series where we discuss disguising dirty data. So this paper discusses the photocatalytic hydrodefluorination of aryl fluorides, and this is a method paper. And so in this paper, the authors report this reaction. It's like a pretty useful reaction, but unfortunately this paper was retracted in late 2020. Originally, there was a published expression of concern, which is something that journals do if they think something might have been falsified, but they're just figuring it out. Now, I'm not sure why they don't just like express, you know, the retraction notice. I don't know why everyone needs to know that there's concern, but I guess there's good transparency on the part of the publisher by doing that. So this is the DOI to the original paper shown here. So in this case, the lead author, Mohammed Khalid, was the only party involved with data falsification. None of the authors should be implicated in this. And so I want to like just go ahead of here and say that Professor Jimmy Weaver is a solid guy. I've met him personally, and it's just really unfortunate what happened to him. You shouldn't see him as the corresponding author to have any blame in this because you have you're supposed to have trust in your researchers. OK, so his research in hydrodefluorination is really useful, and I would encourage you to go check out his papers. He does some really awesome chemistry, and I met him this year at the Winter Fluorine Conference. So as I said before, this should only be seen as a reflection on, on the lead author, not on the corresponding author, and none of the other co-authors should be implicated in this, okay? So my commentary on this is that every spectrum in a manuscript should be looked over with a fine-tooth comb by each author of the manuscript, by each reviewer, as well as the editor. And so this means that when you have spectra, you need to make sure that they're legit. And even if you've prepared spectra yourself, you want to make sure that it doesn't look like you're hiding anything because that can reflect negatively on you, even if you don't have any intention to do that. And so we must have zero tolerance for this. And this kind of thing can't get through the cracks because people will keep doing it as long as they can get away with it. And so if you haven't seen the different types of possible ways to falsify NMR data, this video should provide several examples of that. And so when you have an NMR spectrum, when you don't have a signal, you still have baseline noise. And so no matter how high quality your instrument is, no matter how short or long your experiment is, there will always be background noise, no matter what. So it can be hard to see the noise if you have like a JPEG that's really low resolution in a paper. And so it's better to use high fidelity images. And so oftentimes you can just embed in a spectrum from Mestranova and this will be high res. You can zoom in and as long as you keep zooming in, you'll still be able to see more and more data. It's even better if you include raw NMR files so that people can open that themselves. And so when people falsify NMR data, they tend to do this one of three different ways. Although this isn't an exhaustive list, this tends to cover the main things that people do. So in the first case, they do a really bad job photoshopping a white box over the spectrum. And when you see this, you'll realize this is really obvious and stupid. And if this gets past the review, the editor should be reprimanded because these are so obvious that like this is the type of thing a high schooler would do. OK, so the second thing that they could do is they cut out parts of their spectrum with impurities. So they only show you the clean part, right? It's like when you have guests over, you don't show them your bedroom, which is full of all the junk that you moved out of the other rooms, right? So this is dishonest in the case of uh, NMR spectra, but this can be done inadvertently. So sometimes you're supposed to show certain ranges, and it could be that you happen to have an impurity outside of that range, right? Sometimes you show less than what they ask you to show, and they, they aren't usually too anal about whether or not you're actually showing the full amount of the spectrum. But this is the type of thing a reviewer could catch, and the editor would be like, oh yeah, you need to fix that. Okay, and so the third way, which is the most sneaky way, is using simulated spectra in Mastronova. And so this is really hard to notice unless you look at the baseline of a high, high fidelity spectrum. And because most journals don't force you to provide high quality spectra, it makes it harder to detect these types of things. Okay, So if someone was really clever, they could even hide this doing by like adding on layers of fake baseline. And so if someone wants to cheat, they will be able to cheat, right? But you know, if someone's cheating, it means that they're probably not competent in the first place. Otherwise, they wouldn't be cutting corners. So this is an example of type 1 data falsification where impurities were covered with a white box. So here you can see a white box is blocking part of this peak. You don't just have peaks start and stop. That's kind of weird. Another example is here where you can see this peak is just cut. So that's kind of strange. Now in the next one here, you can see that there's spots where the spectrum's just gone. Like you never have a discontinuous baseline in an NMR spectrum. So this is kind of suspicious. And then over here, we have a flat baseline with other peaks on top of it. So you can see they've just like drawn in a baseline. And then you can see part of the peaks are cut off here. So again, discontinuous, extremely concerning, super obvious. But I do kind of want to roast Orglet for a minute here. So Orglet has just like redacted the original SI. So I was only able to find this because uh, a chem blogger had posted this. It might have been Derek Lowe's uh, uh, blog. And so it's just unfortunate that Orglet does this to just cover it up, to say, like, there was bad spectra, but we got rid of them. No, you can't see them. Sorry. Right. That's kind of dumb. 
Okay, we should be transparent about what was what had gone wrong. Otherwise, it's sketchy, right? So in the case of type one, uh, this was there's a couple examples from Janine Cossey's lab, and so one reference is shown here. There's a couple blog posts on this, and there's a bonus example that I've listed here. Now in terms of type two, this is where we uh, crop the spectrum to only show the clean stuff. And so because I don't want to accuse anyone of doing this intentionally, I'm just going to create a face, fake example with my own data. So in this spectrum, you can see there's some major peaks and some minor peaks. Now you can probably guess that those minor peaks aren't actually part of the sample that we wanted to acquire. They're just there. And so one way that people would hide this is just by zooming out. So you can see that the peaks aren't as tall and maybe the baseline doesn't look quite as bad. But if we look back at the original one, you can see, oh yeah, there's definitely some junk in there. And maybe a couple spectra like this would be tolerated in a typical paper, but if you're trying to hide it, then that's like a little bit deceiving, right? So another way you can do it is by cropping off the ed edges of the spectra. And so you can see there were some impurities to the left of this major peak here, which are can clearly be seen, but in this final spectrum, you can't see them at all. And so this would be the type of thing that you want to avoid, but sometimes this can happen inadvertently. Okay, so type three data falsification, which is the example from the paper that we were discussing earlier, can be seen here, where you can see the background noise uh, exists, the baseline noise is there, and then after this one peak, it's suddenly a thinner line. So that's a little bit suspicious, right? But in the next example, it's even worse. So you can see normal baseline, weird white box, uh, then normal baseline again. So that's a little bit weird. And if we zoom in, you can see that the baseline is completely flat, okay? So this is like clearly falsified data. And so there may have been other examples in this manuscript. They didn't label the ones which were fake or not fake, but I went through and I found this one just to provide an example. Okay, so sometimes authors do get a chance to make things right. Instead of just having a retraction notice, there can be revisions sometimes. Now, if this happens in a journal where the author is an editor, that's concerning. So in the case of Janine Cossey's group, she has been an editor for JOC, and some of the retracted articles that were um, revised or the, the articles where there was academic dishonesty were, revi were revised, were in the journal that she's an editor for, and that just looks bad, okay? So that's not like, even if it's like all above board, that seems sketchy to people who aren't editors, and it seems like an abuse of privilege, even if it isn't. Okay, so here's a blog post that talks about this paper. So what can publishers do? Only high fidelity spectra should be acceptable. If someone's got old spectra, get them to get the original data from the NMR computer, right? Usually we're not trying to get rid of data if possible. It's pretty rare that you can't just get another hard drive, right? So you can find spectra. You can label it properly so that people after you're finished can find your data. Um, and so one way that journals might be able to do this and still give a bit of grace is just give a warning that it's going to be required starting in like a year or two. And then any new spectra can fall into that category of being, you know, recorded properly in a high fidelity form, or better yet, keep all the raw experimental data, okay? And so if we, if these journals create a machine learning algorithm that can automatically analyze spectra to look for stuff like this, we don't have to be like super careful and check. They can just check every time reliably, right? Additionally, this could be used to recognize low quality spectra and then the editor could make a stipulation that if they want to get this publication accepted, they have to provide high fidelity spectra. And so instead of just revising old SIs like Orglet did earlier, it would be better to keep the originals available and then provide an updated SI. If you're like hiding the fake data, that just isn't very like honest. And so it could be used as a teaching tool to keep that like, like I'm trying to show you today. Okay, so it's also time to hold publishers accountable. They should be going above and beyond to protect the integrity of science. Um, they can't be just saying like, well, we need to fully trust everyone. If you're going to charge people money for papers, you better make sure that the papers are like legit, okay? If you're going to charge someone $40 per download, then you can easily pay someone, you know, several days in a week to like go through that thing with a fine tooth comb. How much is like a human hour worth? If, if you're paying someone to be an editor, they can go and look at this and then you can hire people to do this otherwise, right? If you're worried about not having sufficient staff available, there's grad students that you could easily pay that would do this, okay? So this is definitely doable and the only reason that it isn't being done, I believe, is greed or laziness. Okay, so what can supervisors do? If you're a PI, make sure that you're regularly, openly emphasizing the importance of having accurate results. You don't want your students embellishing your results to make you happy. You want them to tell you the truth about what's going on. Um, and if they get low yields, don't necessarily punish them, right? Because this can still be informative as it directs us to do chemistry that's higher yielding, right? So sometimes chemistry just doesn't work that well. And when we know that that's the case, we can look in the pursuit of chemistry that works better. Um, 
Also, it's important to emphasize that you shouldn't assume your students are always trying to falsify data. It's important to have trust with your researchers. So just because you know, you know that some students falsify data, don't assume that your students are doing that as well. Uh, sometimes students will give up on solving a problem too early, however, and so you need to encourage them to find a strategy that will work. But you also don't want to be like a slave driver forcing your student to do something that's not working, which kind of links into the video I posted a couple days ago. Um, so as the Soviets say, it's easier to have trust when you can verify. You want to trust your students, but you also want to be able to look at their spectra and verify that it's legit. So it's important to book time uh, that you can quietly look over a spectra, the spectra for an SI before it's published so that you can make sure that it's all good. No one's going to have any issues of it when you submit it to a publisher. Uh, it's also worth not ignoring any irregularities. If there's any weird overly zoomed in spectrum, if there's stuff that's cropped weird, or if it looks like there's something odd, make sure that your students can uh, explain them because this will make them a stronger chemist. Even if they haven't intentionally falsified or hidden anything, this can still be useful for training them as a researcher. So what can we do? If a spectrum has impurities, be honest about them. Don't like hide them. It's better to have a spectrum showing some impurities than to have like a falsified spectrum. A dirty spectrum is much less detrimental than a manipulated spectrum to your career and to the integrity of science. During the review process, the, the, if, the review, if the reviewers or the editor asks you to obtain better spectra, try your hardest. Sometimes you have unstable stuff that you can't purify. It's, it's possible, right? I've had stuff like this where no matter what you do, the stuff just keeps decomposing and you can't get a better quality spectrum. And it's unreasonable to expect people to, you know, do magic. Sometimes it's not practically possible to obtain really high quality results, but a lot of the time it is. So you need to try, right? You can't just try once and then give up. You have to try a few times usually. So quite often, if you ask a more experienced chemist, such as a senior postdoc in your lab or a senior PhD student, or even people in chemistry communities like the Discord, um, they're willing to help. We want to make science better. We're usually willing to help people solve their problems. And so hopefully this has been an informative video about falsifying NMR data. If you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe. It would really help out the channel if you subscribed on Patreon and decided to support the channel, but that's obviously not necessary. But I do hope regardless, you have a great day.